New York's infamous Blue Note era comes to Mars Hill January 24th for a special one-night-only concert at Mars Landing Galleries. Civil Disobedience is a project bowing to the politically conscious underground jazz of 1960s New York City. You'll hear music from progressive composers such as Bobby Hutcherson, Jackie McLean, Stanley Cowell, Howard Land, Joe Chambers, and James Spaulding. Much of their music wasn't released on record till decades later, and you can hear New York musicians performing it live January 24th. Seating is intimate and limited. For tickets and details, go to MarsLandingGalleries.com. I am a maker, a builder, a baker, although sometimes my messes are all that you'll find. I'll tell a story, both true and allegorial. The process is precious, so it takes up all my time. Tourism officials want people to think of Asheville as Beer City, USA. Never mind that breweries now dot the downtowns of even the smallest of cities. Still, only Asheville can boast itself as the home of the Craft Beverage Institute of the Southeast, courtesy of AB Tech. I would argue that this is a very STEM program, and I even go so far as to say STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. To make a still work, to make a winery work, to make a brewery work, there is going to be a lot of engineering. There's going to be a lot of nerdy science. This is The Overlook with Matt Pikin. Today we talk with Jeff Puff Irvin, the Institute's director. We recorded our conversation in his office, which also doubles as his studio for recording his own podcast called Consuming the Craft. Every semester, people from throughout the South and far beyond come to AB Tech to study at the Craft Institute, many pursuing a career change. While the school teaches the facets of winemaking and distilling the gamuts of spirits, my conversation with Puff largely focuses on beer. We talk about his approach to training tomorrow's professionals in an industry under constant evolution and competition. I began my conversation with Puff Irvin by asking where his students tend to come from. We actually have students from all over the world. We're super unique in a community college system because I've had a student from Russia, a student from Korea. I've got students from all over the United States looking for this program. They move here, take their two-year degree. Sometimes they stick around and they learn and they work. Other times they go to Vietnam. And I have a student that graduated, is now working at a sake kura in Vietnam making sake. So it's an international program at a community college in Western North Carolina. So it is unique. Who and why was that conceived to happen here? So Asheville, North Carolina, for those folks that don't know, we cannot throw a rock and not hit a brewery. There's over 40 in the Asheville area. In Buncombe County, there's way more than that. I can't keep track of them. We have the most visited winery in the world. In the Biltmore. What, the most visited winery the most... in the world is in the Biltmore? Yes. <laughs> There's something sad about that in a way, <laughs> because there are some amazing wineries in places like Napa. Well, and, sure. You know. Yes, of course. And actually, truth be told, and Biltmore will tell you this, some of their grapes are grown in Napa. And so what the other anticipus is, there's craft distilleries, there's nine hard cideries, there's a bunch of beautiful wineries just in Henderson County alone. We operate in this kind of mecca of craft beverage, right? So when... I was hired 10 years ago. The program actually started in August of 2013. The two really brilliant minds behind this, Sheila Tillman and Scott Adams, were working at AB Tech at the time, and they had this idea where they could see the growth in the industry, the growth in the tourism, and they had this vision of starting a program. Now, they built the program with titles and maybe some classes and things and got it approved through the state, but they didn't have an instructor. They hired me. I was the first instructor hired back in August of 2013, as was basically my start date. And I hit the ground running and created the curriculum, the classes, the core of the everything that we do here. Talk about that a little bit, because it's one thing to have a thriving industry. It's another to develop an entire curricula around that What were some elements that you thought were intrinsic to have in an educational program that people might not think go front line with a career in the beer industry? So when you think craft beverage, people think people sitting around and drinking. I would argue that this is a very STEM program. And I even go so far as to say STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. To make a still work, to make a winery work, to make a brewery work. 
there is going to be a lot of engineering. There's going to be a lot of nerdy science. So when we look at the math that goes in behind it, the thermodynamics, fluid flow, it's manufacturing. It's manufacturing at its core, raw material coming in, product going out, transportation, logistics, marketing, public relations. You've got an HR department. You know, as, as you get bigger and bigger in these companies, you have all of these pockets that just encompass all the things that people do. And so when they started this program, they could see the growth in the industry. They could see the growth of what we had here in supplying workers, supplying people to work in these production facilities. Our program is heavily based on hands-on learning. You can read a book on how to drive a car. That doesn't mean I'm going to give you my keys. I remember decades ago when there were a big home brewing push, craft brewing push. People weren't thinking of careers in that way. They just wanted to make beer. This is what I saw in the 70s kind of thing. People would go over to Europe and they would try these amazing things that have been brewed for 200 years. They come here and they couldn't have that. So then they started making it. And then people were like, I want some of that. That's amazing. And so that's where the craft boom with the founding fathers of this industry had started these little small breweries and then people snowballed it into some of these giant facilities that we know and brands that we know and love today. So the diversification of flavor has been brought, I think, from people traveling and education. And now we have all this information at our fingertips. We can learn about something in such a short amount of time. What you can't learn is how to smell, taste, and do. You can read about anything, but when you physically have to do it, it's a different thing. So give us a sense of where education was in this industry before the founding of this institute and how it's evolved. So I have an undergraduate degree in biology. And then great question, what do you do with a biology degree? If you haven't specialized, it's a pretty general thing. I went down to the University of California, Davis, and graduated from the Master Brewers program there. There's another institute in Chicago that's pretty old called the Siebel Institute that trained brewers as well. It's traditionally been an apprentice sort of thing in Europe. Certainly now there's form formalized training, more formalized schooling, and people are learning at compacting some of this stuff that they would learn over years of training to a shorter amount of time. For instance, our two-year degree. That being said, I think that there's a lot of industries, which I think that have gotten away from the internship, apprenticeship kind of program that really could benefit from going back to something like that. I guess what fascinates me and what I'm curious about is there was a beer industry that was developing before the development of this institute. They've been drinking beer for like 5,000 BC. But were people viewing it as a career in the same way? You were talking about now there's 40 plus breweries in this region, not to mention wineries, other distilleries. What has happened to make it a career pursuit that maybe even in the early 2000s, people weren't thinking of this industry as a career pursuit to train for? I think if you went to school as a chemical engineer, I think that getting a job at Budweiser was a big deal. I do. Or Miller, Coors, any of those. I mean, that's where they're starting off at. Those were the optimal destinations? If you were a chemi, what, what more fun would it be to work at one of those giant breweries? Uh -huh. And it's chemical engineering at its finest. Okay. You think about the sheer volume that those companies can put out and process. Jack Daniels, the amount of barrels that they put down in a day is staggering. But they're the same day one as they are in year 10, year 20. Those products don't change. Where is the challenge in that for a chemical engineer? Oh my, that's the hardest thing to do. You yeah. mean the consistency yes. is? Yes. Every year you have this agricultural based product, whether it's barley or hops or the wine industry's got it a little bit more figured out because they sell it as a vintage. Whiskey, any of these things, if you have a beer, a Miller Lite, if you have it here in Asheville or you have it in Sri Lanka, it's going to taste the same. They're using completely different grain bases. So that barley that grows is going to change. Then it goes through a malting process. Then it goes through a brewing process. The fact that they can make it the same, wow. And I, that's, it's not about brewing 50 or 60 different styles of beer. If your flagship is your flagship, me as a consumer has an expectation for it to taste the same as it did last time. And that's what I guess my naivete thinking <laughs> you can have a granular formula on paper, but the ingredients inherently change right? every season. And the thing about beer is we brew it all year round, whiskey all year round. Wine is a little bit different. We press the grapes, we start to ferment them, and they're released as a vintage. And so that's a little bit smarter because the consistency, you're giving way to the fact that this growing season, Mother Nature has gave us more rain or less rain or the grapes struggled more or there was a fungus that came through. The, the way that the process these things to even make them the same is 
is really the challenge. So you talked about if you were a chemical engineer major Back in early 90s. Right. So now, who are you drawing? Who are your students? What angles are they coming from? Because <laughs> it's not just chemical engineering. No, 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 no. I'm getting students from, first of all, all over the planet with just the craziest backgrounds. The majority of my students already have a four-year degree. So talk about you went through the UC Davis U- Master Brewers Program. Master yeah. Brewers Program. But obviously things have evolved and changed. What did you feel you had to bring to this program to start that maybe the school, let alone students, would not have thought about? So I graduated from UC Davis. I was a brewer. I ran a brewery for 10 years commercially. I knew that the students wanted to brew on commercial-sized equipment, and that was important because If you're brewing on a five-gallon system that has a direct fire element under it, it's not the same as brewing at 300 gallons with steam. When you've seen the expansion to ginger beer and these other spirits that maybe 10, 15 years ago weren't topical, has the program had to evolve and grow? And if so, talk about how things you're teaching now and elements of the curricula here that 10 years ago weren't on your palate. Well... Seltzer, hard seltzer. Six years ago, nobody was talking about it. And it's an alternative beverage. Some of us out there may be old enough to remember like Bartles and James wine coolers. Oh, my God. (laughs) Anybody who was a teen in the 80s. (laughs) Terrible. When you go to the 90s, Zima. These are alternative beverages. These are basically the original seltzers. They were taking a beer base. They were filtering them. They were making a very clear Mike's Hard Lemonade. These four loco. Do you remember Boone's Farm? (laughs) Boone's Farm is an interesting conundrum because some of it is malt based and some of it's actually wine based. Huh. So that's an interesting one because... But the, it was all headache-based. Oh, 100%. Okay, exactly. Because I remember vaguely, that was not something that most people consumed in moderation. No, it was designed <laughs> to be chugged. But, but you're talking about the evolution of these spirits so, that... It, seltzer. It, seltzer yeah. was a big thing that we'd never even thought would cross our curriculum. But now it's an integral part of what we teach to make sure that people can make these these products and make them consistent again do and, your, and be able to get about to the shelf. Do your facilities here at the school do you have to add or change equipment or augment your equipment to accommodate different kinds of spirits? It's not only the equipment, but it's also the testing equipment, right? So as we've expanded what we do, we have to make sure on the quality control, quality assurance wise, that we have equipment to test that. We have some things where we can run cider, wine, beer, and spirits through this machine, and it will spit out the alcohol percentage and how much residual sugar is inside of it. So even the students have diversified on what they want to make for something we call the capstone. The capstone Stone is this anticipus of everything you've ta- been taught, and they have to basically present a beer, wine, cider, spirit, a product that they've made here to a group of industry professionals after their second year, right? And they sit down, and we call it like a drink tank, like a, a riff on Shark Tank, right? So we sit around, they present this product, they have to present a business plan, they have to present a marketing plan, and then these local professionals crush their dreams. They, really? Yeah, they, honestly, these guys and gals that have been working out in the industry that have been doing this for years, maybe have already tried this. And they're like, here, we're going to save you money. Here's why this isn't going to work here. It may work where you're thinking about it, but it didn't work here when we tried it 15 or 20 or five or six years ago. When you're talking about it works or doesn't work, how much of this is the actual taste and the content of the beverage itself versus how much of it is the marketing, the packaging, the branding the selling of this. So back in the 90s, I would say, if you build it, they will come. No more. The consumer is way more educated than they ever have been about taste. They're more responsible with what they're putting in their body. And I think that is the baseline. And you have to have quality. You have to have consistency. Once you get that, then you can start spending that money to tell people about it. Because if, you're, if you have this expectation of a product and someone comes in and the second time it's different... If it's not, if it's supposed to be the same product, they're going to know right away because the consumer is more educated about anything that has to do with craft more, more so now than ever because of the apps, because of the internet, because of the enthusiasm for these products that has been built over the course of the craft beverage industry. More after this. Mm -hmm.
The First Look newsletter brings you news headlines from all over Asheville every weekday morning. You can scan it at a glance and see if there's something you've missed or just need to know more about. There are no ads disguised as stories, just the headlines in a quick, easy read. Get the First Look newsletter for free at podavl, that's P-O-D-A-V-L dot com slash newsletter. Now, there's one thing about selling it at retail. There's another about competing among breweries locally, the tourist dollar, local dollars. Yeah. What draws people to your brewery versus your competitor's brewery? Do you go into that element in your course too? So when they are going to pick their internship, we tell them your homework is to go drink in moderation, but you go drink. You find the culture the fit, the vibe, how things are going in these different facilities. Because each one kind of, not say they had their niche, but you're going to feel more comfortable working for X because of the products that they make that you enjoy. You like the way that their logo looks. You like the way that their artwork is. You see other people around the facility that are more closely related to what you know, like you just get that feel, that vibe. All of those things you're talking about are not to do with taste. Done. They're all, that's really interesting. And you just said a moment ago, it used to be, if you build it, they will come. That's no longer the case. And I wonder, you don't see often, but it happens very occasionally. A brewery will close here. And, and, and that's an interesting thing too, because what we've seen now is some of these original brewers, the forefathers of this whole industry movement, they are getting to retirement age. And if they don't have a succession plan, they don't have a child that wants to take over the family business. They don't have any really way to move on from it. That I'm also seeing. So there could be this, if you don't have the quality or COVID killed a lot of them just with funding. If you were caught right in a big expansion and you had this giant outlay of cash and you couldn't recoup that money over COVID, th there was some financial hardship for a lot of folks. Are we talking about local breweries or are we talking nationwide. about nationwide? Nationwide. Not people who were trying to sell at retail or you're talking about entities that were dependent on people visiting their facility? Both. Okay. Because if you expanded into packaging and retail, you have laid down a lot of cash for packaging equipment, for personnel, for labels. And if you think about all of it, the design work that's coming with the self-adhesive label that's going on a can or a bottle, or even the six pack holder, and then the case box it goes into, and then they are going to be shipped in large quantities. So now you have, so you've outlaid all this cash for then a diminished sales that happened potentially over that time where no one could really go anywhere, right? The margins at your tap room or at your facility are always the highest. You're not paying a distributor. You're basically selling right off the tap. That went away. And so if you were, that was your business model where, you know, you want to drive traffic to your tasting room, that's going to help you sell merchandise. That's going to help you hats and t-shirts. That's that walking billboard of the folks that are leaving. You lost that. And that was the highest margin. And then if you didn't have a way to can or sell beer to go or have that opportunity for someone to take a piece of that with them, when you couldn't be open, how did you generate any revenue? I guess it depends on ambition, right? There, yep. the, the, you can be the king of local tap rooms or the queen of local tap rooms and do just fine. So the tap rooms that have revived and come back strong, what have been the factors involved in that? Are you seeing some strong tap rooms who maybe pre-COVID weren't as strong, who have used the post-COVID time to either recalibrate and make something of themselves well, in sure. a what, bigger way? Sure. I think that time was introspective for a lot of folks. What can we do? What can we do better? We know it's not going to last forever. How can we capture folks coming back in here? Not everyone's going to like beer. Not everyone's going to like wine. Not everyone's going to want to drink X. So if we diversify not only what we're making, and that's what I'm seeing mostly right now, there's a couple of things of diversification that come up to me. One is the kinds of beers you're actually serving. And I want to get to both elements, but let's talk about diversification of styles of beer. Okay. And I personally think IPAs are the biggest <laughs> scam in beer. Okay. I, a company like Burial, for instance, Burial Brewing, they'll have four or five IPAs on tap, not one American pale ale, not one wheat beer. And do you know why they do that? Why? Because they sell. 
What is that? They're Th- people that are looking for those styles of beer. They actually have a dark Czech lager on right now that is unbelievably good. A former student that works there, he dropped a can off the other day and I had it and it was fantastic. I guess it's an acquired taste. I don't get, I, I, everybody's taste is different and I totally allow that. But when you see these beers that have these really high IBU numbers. Yeah, international bitterness. Unit, but, yeah. Yes, but and that they're intentionally really bitter. People that enjoy those beers, I always call them sadomasochists. Bitter in biology translates to poison. So your child, your loved ones, when you were little, you probably didn't like Brussels sprouts. You probably didn't like broccoli. You probably didn't like asparagus. Those are big, pungent, and sometimes bitter foods, right? You have half as many taste buds as you did when you were little. And you've trained yourself to diversify some of the flavors, tastes, and smells that you enjoy. So you're saying people have developed a taste for poison. You don't see a lot of very young people drinking like very heavily peated 21-year-old scotch. One, because it's expensive. But two, it's just a huge flavor. Elderly people salting their food way more. They have the sensory recognition of what that's supposed to taste like. The sodium chloride helps bring more of that flavor to their palate to accentuate the flavors that they knew it was. So you're saying these IPAs have that baked in. So the International Bitterness Unit, it's a chemical that is translated. It's an isomerized alpha acid that comes from the hops. It comes from the manufacturing process. What's the first beer you had? Probably a domestic style lager you stole from your parents. Yes, I remember Lowenbrows and Henry Weinhardt. Oh, yeah. And then not having enough money for that and having to go down to natural (laughs) light and lucky lager. Yeah. So that's when you're introduced with beer. Natural light is not devoid of flavor, but it's going to be a little bit on the sweeter side. It has a 50% corn, 50% barley. It's going to be light in flavor. It's going to be that introduction. Beer intrinsically is bitter because of the hops that are put in it. Not a lot of hops in natural light. Now, as you evolved as a drinker, I've seen people get introduced to that domestic style lager, and then they start looking for something a little bit malty. So they look at like Amberbach or the original fat tire, something that had a little bit more malt backbone. And then they go full circle to crazy IPAs. Like They're looking for the hoppiest beers they can. Once they achieve that, then they go to the next step. And people jump on and off on this train. But in general, this is what I've seen. They go to the IPA, and then they want to go to these strange, far-off regions, like these crazy Belgians and fruited beers and single releases and people that put like shoe leather in the beer, and you have to wait in line for them. (laughs) Is that a thing? No, but (laughs) now that being said, uh, mezcal, which is a beautiful spirit from Mexico, traditionally was aged in a, and some of it was aged in a leather bag. I was wondering about the IPA craze. I I marvel that there are people who swear by them and that there are breweries in town, burial among them, or tap rooms in town that have a preponderance of it. Isn't one IPA enough or two? They have to have four or five on the menu. I just I think it's brilliant because people are buying them. I guess Keep so. Keep making them. Here's the second strand of diversification that I've noticed is having elements of your tap room that aren't about the beer. And going back to Burial, they recently opened a concert facility called Eulogy. I went to a show there. Really nice, small, intimate room. How do you see those non beer or non-spirit elements of a tap room becoming important to the success of a tap room? I think diversifying the opportunity for someone to stay there for a longer period of time and enjoy maybe two or three beers. So if it's a sports bar, they got a TV, so you have a ton of different games on. The music venues, like Rabbit Rabbit next to Asheville Brewing Company, they're a part of that. They supply the beer and the spirits to that venue. Brilliant. And the Orange Peel is owner of Rabbit Rabbit. Same with Asheville Brewing Company and Orange Peel came together to do that. So it's one of those things where not only are you diversifying the stuff you have on draft, but you're diversifying the opportunity for people to stick around. So you also see in some of these breweries, you brought up Burial, their original facility, the inside of it's pretty small, but they have all these little pockets outside. Yeah, we can talk to someone. Yeah, they have an outdoor stage that's never used. This little (laughs) tiny stage. I want to do improv shows there. I've wondered why is that stage rarely if ever used. Pitch it to them. I I, think they'd love it. Yeah. Now we talked at the beginning of this conversation about how we have forty plus breweries, but every city has breweries now. Silva has two or three breweries. They should. Waynesville has so. So is it becoming harder for Asheville? We still call ourselves Beer City USA. Every city can call itself Beer City USA to some degree. Sure. 
is Asheville going to have to work harder to compete for that beer tourism dollar going forward? Sure. If you can get local craft beer at any city that you're but what we have, which nobody else has, is if we want to say that we have, as far as volume and as far as just size alone, we have three of the top 25 breweries in the country right here that you could visit in one day. You can go down to Oscar Blues in Brevard. You can go to New Belgium and you can go to Sierra Nevada. Three just giant breweries. Is, is Highland becoming in that echelon? Tell me if I'm wrong in assessing this from my vantage, from a locally born brewer. First one here. Yeah. First one here and that they are... Technically not the first brewery here. No. There was one called Blue Rooster that went out. Oh, really? Okay. okay. But look what they've become. <laughs> And look what their tap room is. They have that outdoor concert facility, which th- that which I love that it's there, but they I don't know how they got tourism development authority money. They got eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars of TDA money. They're not a nonprofit. I don't know how they got it, but they're the only It's a cool venue, man. It's I've a seen cool some ve- great shows. It's there. a cool <laughs> venue, but they are to my knowledge, are the only nonprofit to ever get TDA money. I still want to figure out how that happened. Would they be considered in that same breath of So what they're considered is regional. So they're in multiple states surrounding Highland. When I say Sierra Nevada, they're international. You can get their beer up in Canada, you can get it over in Europe. Same with New Belgium, who is also part of Bell's Brewing Company, and it was part of an Australian buyout, right? You have a regional company like Highland and Wicked Weed and Burial to some degree. Their outreach is it keeps increasing, right? Yeah. And so you have some of these regional breweries here, and then you've got ones that are just for local distribution or, or maybe statewide distribution. So that gets to a question I had earlier about aspiration. Is it incumbent? on some of these brewers to grow and grow? Do they have to? Or if they run a successful high margin local operation, Highland does. Why even step out to be a regional brewer when that just takes on more headache, the distribution? Well, it, it does take out more headache. But if there's a de- that much demand for a product, you should supply that demand. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> somebody else is going to. We've talked about the different lines of spirits that you're educating your students on. What are the career prospects today? Are they the same today? Are they greater today than they were even five years ago or 10 years ago when you founded this? I think they're greater today, and here's why. I think the places that are growing are looking for, you know, some of the students I have have opportunities to keep growing in these facilities. As the facilities grow, their positions will change. Their monetary compensation will change. Ultimately, we give you a piece of paper at any school. My job is to make that piece of paper worth a lot of money. How much of the success in this business comes down to what you learn versus inherent talent? I think it is, has to do a lot with what you learn because you can learn to taste. Now, genetically predisposition, there are things that people can't taste. Honestly, you should figure that out for yourself if you're going to get into this industry. And that's part of the formalized training that we do here. If you can't taste a chemical, diacetyl is a, a byproduct of the yeast metabolism. So yeast will throw this thing off. It's called a visceral diketone. And then it'll turn into this chemical called diacetyl, which tastes like movie buttered popcorn. It tastes, it's a buttery flavor. Now, in some beverages, like a really buttery Chardonnay, it's part of the flavor. It's supposed to be there. In other things, like a Pilsner, it should never be there. And so it's one of those chemicals where if you have the predisposition to taste it, then you know whether it needs to be there or not and where that balance is going to be. If you can't taste it, then you need to hire somebody that can because Mm -hmm. stylistically it shouldn't be in particular products. You said you can train yourself to taste. Do you have versions of in your school? Like I think of a guy like Sam Altman, who is the founder of ChatGPT. Do you have your Sam Altman? Do you have your Elon Musk? Do you have your Bill Gates in your program? Have you graduated people who you go, oh my God, that person is going to rule this industry? Yeah. We've had some absolute rock stars. Yes. Yes, we have. What makes a rock star in this industry? Passion, attitude, willingness to learn, and humble. When they make a mistake, they admit it. And the biggest thing is, when you need help, ask for help. How many students are coming through your program every year? So I limit the cohort to 24 students. That's small. How many are on the waiting list? Here, A lot sometimes. Here's why. 
I know in May I can graduate 24 students, and they can find a job locally if they have to. If they want to move back to Kansas and find a job, great if they came from Kansas. But they want to go back to Oklahoma, they want to go back to Texas, wherever they want to go back, I'm pretty confident that they're going to be able to find a job in this industry. But if I graduate 24 in this area, I'm comfortable saying that year in and year out. Now, could I have more students? Yes. That would, one, diminish the hands-on learning, and two, it's not responsible. If you have a passion for beverage, whether it's on the marketing side, entrepreneur, you want to own your, open your own place, you want to learn this product, you want to get into the industry, nobody can take the education away from you. And getting education in just about anything is a, a relatively good investment. What it translates into, as far as career-wise, is really up to you. If you value the Overlook's place in Asheville's media landscape, please consider joining dozens of others who are supporting the show through my Patreon crowdfunding page. Become a member for as little as $5 a month. Visit patreon.com slash the Overlook podcast. I want to thank my guest today, Jeff Puff Irvin, director of the Craft Beverage Institute of the Southeast at AB Tech. Our First Look newsletter gives you just a handful of daily headlines from around the local media landscape to get you on your morning. We also have a weekly newsletter devoted to all things The Overlook that hits you every Friday. Both are free and available at podavl.com slash newsletter. Our theme music for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes courtesy of the Asheville band The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on any social media channel at AVL Overlook. And I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook with Matt Pikin. Curious how the word y'all has conquered the English-speaking world? Ever wonder why there are so many dollar stores and what they mean to the American landscape? I'm Anissa Khalifa, host of the new podcast, The Broadside, from North Carolina Public Radio. We explore stories at the heart of the American South. Each week, we go beyond the headlines and cover a single topic that impacts our region and explain how it reverberates across the country. Follow The Broadside wherever you get your podcasts.